Hey, hey, this is Coach Rick, and you are listening to The Bald Truth. That's right. Welcome to The Bald Truth Leadership Podcast, the place where you get the straightforward, no-nonsense scoop on leadership and self-growth, both personally and professionally. The Bald Truth Leadership Podcast is brought to you by the Peak Performance Group. I'm your host, Coach Rick Colster. I'm a certified executive business coach and the chief coaching officer for the Peak Performance Group where we help people and organizations align and maximize their potential. Today, we brought in someone who has an, is absolutely an expert in this self-quarantine, because we're right now in the middle of this COVID-19 self-quarantine thing. And he's got a ton of leadership experience, which is why I wanted to bring him on. But now, knowing that he has known how to self-quarantine, going to give us some tips and hints and some experiences. Um, and it's a guy I've gotten to know over the last few years, and one of the men that I consider – a man of real integrity. There's one of the traits about our guest here is that he is a guy that you can count on. Uh, today, welcome Eric Dyson. And what can I say about Eric? Well, one thing I know about him is he's in a hell of an MC. He's masterful and he's helped a bunch of charitable organizations uh, really grow to new levels of success. And that's one of the things, that's actually how we met. I know he's a man of faith, strong man of faith, and one you can count on when the stuff hits the fan. When that shit is the fan, folks, he's the guy you can go to. And his experience in self-quarantine and working with teams and knowing how to get them over the finish line is really one of the things that I, I really want to dig into with him today. So, Eric, welcome to the bald truth, brother. Rick, it is an honor to be here. And everybody says that, but I really mean it. I'm honored that you have me on here. Thank you. Oh, we're glad to have you, man. It's getting a lot of fun. So let's dig in. We're right in the middle of this COVID-19 shelter in place in Dallas, Fort Worth. And as you can see, Eric's working from his home office today, it looks like. And uh, we're, we're at the K2 Ranch right here in our studio. But we've been, we've been told now pretty much for the last week or so to shelter in place. And we've got, I think, another two weeks or so left till we reevaluate. But you've got some experience in what we can call shelter in place. Why don't you share with us your time as a submar submariner? That'll work. Submariner. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's take, you know, I've seen all kinds of interesting memes pop up uh, on social media from submariner. So I want everybody to imagine this, you are quarantined in your home and you don't go out. You're with 150 of your favorite friends and you can't leave for 60 days. So you have so much food. You're actually walking on cans to get around from point A to point B. And that is true, when we would go to sea for 60 days, we would have some of the food stored in cans and we would be walking on it for about the first two weeks. So you would have the floor of cans, of canned goods that you could open in, obviously open and serve. What do you do with the trash? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> because as much as goes on with a nuclear submarine and all the weapons and everything, one of the questions everybody asks is, how do you get rid of the trash? Yeah, We actually had a tube, resembles a torpedo tube, and it went down to the bottom of the submarine. You'd have to slow down a little bit, but you would put it in cans, put it in this tube, and then you'd flush water through it, and, and it would drop. And we'd be doing it in the deepest parts of the ocean, and not, not like it was a pollution thing, but you know, most of it was food that we were getting rid of. But we had this tube that shot out the bottom of the submarine. <laughs> oh, how great is that? That's pretty awesome. So, so again, self-quarantining now. What are some of the things that you're doing right now in, in this area of your life? I mean, we all, I, I've been locked in place since I think the 14th. So I'm on week two week or day 13, almost 14 for me, since I've been out of the house in any way, shape or form or in any major way, shape or form. I've walked out of the house. I've been walking, you know, trying to get out and get some exercise. But what are you doing to uh, shelter in place now? You know what, Rick, let me, let me give you an answer that applies to everyone. We all have this list of things we're going to do someday when we don't have anything better to do, don't we? Right? Oh, yeah. And, and so I've got my list. There's a couple of things I'm doing in the backyard. T tonight, my wife's got me hanging a chandelier, okay? So it's, you know, I'm the victim of those people that says, hey, I'm one of those husbands that say to my wife, I'll get around to this when I have nothing better to do. But we're just doing things around the house that otherwise we don't have time to. Rick, you put out a great reading list. Uh, I don't know whether it was this week, but uh, sure, I think that's fabulous for people to go look at that list and pick at least one book and get it done. You know, that's one of the things is 
Uh, and for those listeners, I put out the 15 top books. You can find it on our Facebook page. Uh, you can go to the Bald Truth, Rick, Coach Rick's Bald Truth Facebook page, and you'll see that list there somewhere. Um, I'll probably put it up and tag it somewhere so you can see it permanently. I had to put a little, uh, what they call it, pin it. And um, what are the books that you're reading? What are the things that you're doing? I mean, I, that's one thing. Wait, hey, look, I had to redo the laundry room. We painted it, put new shelves in, cleaned it up. It's like all of a sudden, all those honey dudes are getting honey done. Yeah, and uh, you know, I do, what I'm going through is a little extra time. You said man of faith, I'm spending a little time on a Bible study. In fact, I'm going to do an online Bible study for people that feel they're cooped up and getting to church is a little bit of a challenge. Some church, church is doing that virtually. So I'm, I'm spending some time in the book of Daniel because it always intimidated me. Uh, but I also want to talk about one of the books on your list that I've read because, uh, you know, talk about just day to day. to set, How can we take this stuff from the Bible? Right. And I don't want if somebody's listening to this podcast and they're not a Christian, please, please don't tune out at this point. OK, because there's a lot of good advice in that book. For daily living one of the books on your list is in a pit with a lion on a snowy day what a great book i read that probably 10 12 years ago and it really helped me so first chronicles eleven twenty two is one of the verses i have memorized it's about benaya a valiant fighter of kebzeo a doer of great deeds who doesn't want to be called a doer of great deeds all right and what did he do he chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day right and, and when you talk about how to get ready for every day, I've got in my list of prayers, part of my list of daily prayers is what should I be doing as a worker for my boss, right? And that's okay. one of the Bible verses I read. I'm supposed to be a doer of great deeds, right? I'm supposed to be chasing lions. That's what we should be doing for a living. You know, it's interesting. And just to put it in context a little bit, for those that are listening, uh, Benaiah was, uh, was it David's? basically his head of security, chief bodyguard. Absolutely and imagine this though, but imagine this. And the, the story was he met a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Now that sounds pretty scary in and of itself, but now put yourself back 2000 years ago. Now he, all he had was a loincloth, some sandals and a spear. It wasn't like he had an M16 or, you know, a couple of nines to take the, the lion out. No, he was fighting a lion in a freaking loincloth and some sandals and a spear. That's got to take a set of big, you know, big belief. I think that's what it is. It's belief system, his belief that he could do it. So think about this as, as we think about leaders today, what we can do for our boss. How do, how do you keep that belief? How to keep that faith, Eric, today? As you're sitting here working every day, how do you keep the faith in yourself? To to do that by yourself, Rick, I think is very, very difficult. And, and I don't remember, I'll probably butcher Jim Rohn's words, but you're, you're not going to find too many successful hermits, right? Um, and, and you just need to have a core group of people that you can lean on. Because I have bad days. I have days when I don't want to be around negative people. I have days when I am the negative person. But I have a group of guys I get together with once a week. And, and you can call this a mastermind group. This is actually my accountability group, my prayer group. But we get together and we talk about life. We pray for each other, yeah. But we talk about things that are going on. We lift each other up and we stay positive. And, and I think it doesn't matter whether you make it a spiritual group, a prayer group. Some people call it the mastermind group. Um, and this week there was a decision to do a virtual meeting on our social distancing. Sure. Um, it wasn't quite, quite the same thing, but we still met uh, doing a meeting much like we're doing here on Zoom. So I, I think having that core group of people that you can rely on to stay positive and lift you up is something everybody's got to have. And that's what I'm really relying on right now. Oh, amen to that. See, I, I have a men's group that we, we work, I belong to the last 17 years called Wingman. And this morning I was out on the patio. We meet every, every Friday, 7 a.m. I was out on the patio and because I'm, use Zoom as part of our business. So I set a Zoom call up for us and we had five or six guys that, said, hey, I, I'll get up and get on Zoom. And it, it is, it's like that. It's an accountability group. And yes, it's faith-based, but it's also an accountability. We affirm each other, accountability, and we accept anybody. And that's the kind of the cool part. I think you need to do that. Keep that. So I want to learn, I want to hear some more about your time as a submariner. And, you know, some of the fun stuff that you did. How did you, what were some of the things you learned 
in doing that, in, in living that experience that transitioned and, and made it into your, I guess, civilian life? Um, I, I think, Rick, to, and again, I want to answer that in a way that applies to your listeners. Um, and part of my leadership philosophy is understanding what your purpose is, okay? And you can talk about whether that's at your job, whether it's as a father, whether it's a husband, where, where your purpose is. And, and, and somebody can go, okay, what's the meaning of life? No, we're not quite going there, but pretty close. And where I'm going with that as a submariner, you know, we were in the military and our purpose was to put ordinance on target. Well, what do I mean by that? Um, we weren't designed to be this black tube driving around in the ocean. We were meant to be part of the armed forces. And if we were not able to defend our country, we didn't fulfill our purpose. And in the nuclear power business, where I'm going with that is, there was such high standards to not get anything wrong. And as you can imagine, that's the right answer with a nuclear reactor on board, right? You have sure. to get it all right. And I stress to the crew that we were not a bunch of high tech plumbers. Uh, so if we, all we could do was operate the engine room and, and do all these computers or systems right, we were missing our purpose in life. So um, part of the philosophy was what was our purpose? And the other thing that I, I figured out as a leader, Rick, as you can imagine in life and just in, in the military, there are about 8,000 things to do every day and you got time for about 25 of them, right? Sure. And you have to figure out what are the right 25 things you have to be doing. And, and so part of my leadership philosophy was, how do I keep and motivate? Uh, I had a department of 55 people when I was chief engineer. How do we take what is almost impossible to com complete every day and, and not just beat up these kids? And some of them were kids. How do we not just beat up them? How do we encourage them? How do we motivate them? How do we keep them going every day and inspire them to be better people? Okay, so that leads me to a, a, another thought here is, how do you keep that mindset when there's negative Nellies out there? Because we know the world lives in the world of negative, unfortunately, but it's the reality is we live in a world of what we can't do, how it won't work, how, what were you thinking kind of mindset. How do, you, how do you manage that? And how do you keep the right mindset in a world full of negative Nellies? Well, there's, <laughs> let's talk about it in the Navy for, well, no, I'll put off the Navy because in the Navy, whatever I got with, I was almost stuck with, right? Go to yeah. see those guys and I couldn't hire and fire. So in the world today, w when you think about it, you have to distance yourself as much as you can from those people, right? And, and the, the quick comeback is, well, you can only do that so much, right? And maybe, mm -hmm. it's, it, maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's some, first of all, it's somebody you can do something about, you need to do something about it, all right? Okay. So, if it's an employee of yours, I'm not saying you turn around and fire that person tomorrow, but you try to motivate them. But to your point, uh, coach, some of those people are always going to be negative. And maybe it's to your, both of your best interest to find something else for them. If it's your boss, quite possibly another employment option is what's going on for you. So let's take, and those are kind of the extremes, obviously, right? I want to go back to something I said earlier. Remember I told you my accountability group, right? You need to sure. surround yourself with those positive people. All right. And when the negative world starts weighing on you, you've got uh, a reservoir of positivity to go to. And I think that is just the way to make that happen. Okay. That makes a ton of sense. So let's talk about this. So, man, you're talking about leadership. You're talking about working with, you know, your boss, your, your people you work with. So, what are your core leadership principles and how did you come to define them? You know, do you, I know that you have them because we've talked about it. And one of the things I found very interesting and the reasons I want to have you on was you had some really interesting core leadership principles. And I'm just curious as if you can share those with the folks that are listening, but also how did you come to define them for yourself? Um, sure. That, I, I love the question. And, and it goes back to something I mentioned earlier, right? I, I knew that uh, as chief engineer, uh, I could have one of my sailors just, just killing himself for 12 hours straight, doing something that's right and doing it well. And then I could come around the corner and find something that wasn't done. And I could choose to, to belittle or, or chew out this sailor, even though he was doing a great job, right? So I, I kind of figured out how do we take this stressful environment and how do I elevate people 
to want to do better. All right. And, and I'll start with your, the idea of the leadership philosophy. It's kind of, you know, how do you set your compass, right? What's your true north? And, and I have four elements that I don't know how well they're on my blog. I, I probably need to add this, but, but there's four elements you need to put in your uh, leadership philosophy. That's anybody's leadership philosophy. Okay. Number one, it needs to be universal. Well, what do I mean by universal? It needs to apply. You need to apply this philosophy if you're in the military, if you're in corporate America, with your family, with a volunteer organization, wherever you are, when you decide on a leadership philosophy, you need to apply it in any situation. It needs to be timeless. That's number two. I don't care so about technology. universal is number one. Universal number one. Timeless. Time, number okay, two. tell us about timeless. I don't care whether you have a cell phone. I don't care whether it's 1500s. I don't care if it's 2000 years from now. The principles that make us and drive us as people are not going to change. It needs to be timeless. I don't care about technology. I don't care about what's going on in the world. Okay. Uh, number three. It needs to be based on what you believe about people. All right. Okay. So very simply, do you believe people are generally good or do you believe people are generally bad? Do you believe people are generally industrious or do you believe people are generally lazy? All right. Now this could be that I just have to find the people that are, if you believe people are generally lazy, you find the people that are not lazy. All right. That could go in. Right. So number one, it's universal. Number two, it's timeless. Number three, what you believe about people and number four, what you believe about natural laws. What do I mean about natural laws? Stephen Covey refers to the law of the farm when we talk about natural laws, right? I can't plant corn in September and rush it and work three times as hard and expect a crop in October. There are certain laws that are natural laws we can't cram for. So part of why I say mine is faith-based, I have a certain belief about who my creator is and what will happen to me in eternity. That's a natural law. Someone may not subscribe to that same principle of my creator and attorney, but there are natural laws that we cannot break. We can't cram on the farm. So those are the four, okay? And if somebody wants to read up more, you can go to my blog. It's called Truth Soundings. Uh, and then so that leads me to the seven elements. Number one is you define your purpose. Why are we here? So I give a great example. If, if I decide I want to be a charitable organization, and my outreach is to homeless people. Well, you can't accuse me of not serving people because uh, we have to look at orphans or some other group. You know, I've just decided that my purpose is for homeless people. You define, this, define your purpose and you don't have to serve everybody. Number two, find the right people. And I think just about everybody would agree, you find the right people, you solve most of your problems. Well, I think, and I don't want to cut you off here, but I, and I love that because people are what drives any, any business and without people, there are no leaders. There's well, nobody to lead. You don't have any, the right people. And some people were not leaders and that's okay. And I give this really uh, silly example when I say the right people, I didn't say good people. I said the right people. Okay. I'm six foot three and I weigh more than I should. I am not going to be the next great horse jockey at Lone Star Park. All right. I'm still waiting to get called by the NFL. I'm too old. My knees don't work. Right. We have certain gifts, certain talents. The right people need to be what you need them to be. Okay. Number three is you train them right. All right. You have to tell them what you expect. You've got to give them the right training. Number four, give them the tools they need to do their job. It's Excellent. incredibly yeah. frustrating when, when you train them right, tell them what you need and they just don't have what, I mean, Picture a mechanic without the right tools. That's a very simple example, right? Oh, that's five, a perfect example. Or a home builder without a hammer. And maybe it's a sales system, right? Maybe it's, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. You need the right tools to do your job. Pat them on the back often enough. And often enough is the key word. Not everybody deserves a pat on the back every day. If you mess up, you don't deserve a pat on the back. Sure. But often enough, we have to pat them on the back. And I've got this saying that says, if you pat them on the back often enough, you can be as hard as you need to be when you need to be. Okay. Well, that's interesting because uh, I'm, I'm an advocate of the, the five love languages and I'm a huge affirmation is my number one in those five love languages. So I love the pats on the back. And uh, like one of the things probably reasons in my history that I've left positions and jobs is because I didn't get those. Those are critical. Those are important. Well, and you bring up a good point too, Rick, and I can tell a story from the Navy real quick is, is, and, and you receive, you're complimented in a certain way, right? People 
one would be complimented in the way that's in their language, right? I had, this was really towards the end of my entire time in the Navy, I had a sailor leaving and, and I did an exit interview with him and he said, you know, engineer, uh, it's nice that we get these letters that are signed by the Admiral and tell us what a great job we did. But you know, they come three months after we did that great job. All I really want is for the captain to leave his stateroom, walk back into the engine room and tell me I did a good job. And that would be more sure. than enough for me. So yeah, patting people on the back. Some people it's, you know, financial rewards. Some it's they just need the recognition. Um, so, so that's number five. Number six is setting a standard for excellence. We can't pat people on the back just because they tried and did a good, right? We have to have standards that this is where we are. And, wait and a minute, wait a minute. You mean participation trophies don't count? And I know that's, you know, participation trophies don't count. At least after the heck? Eight years old. I, I, I know. When we think about it, Rick, sometimes you, you've got a team that's, that's good people, maybe the right people, but the team's not functioning. We're, we're not going to pat people on the back, right? And there are the book, the, the four stages of, you know, team building is great. And the last part is be an inspiration, right? Because you can do all six of the things I pointed out real quickly. Define your purpose, find the right people, train them right, give them the tools, pat them on the back, set a standard for excellence, and not show up. So the okay. leader has yeah. to be an inspiration. Whether that's showing up, you may not have to know how to use every one of the tools, but you have to be an inspiration. You want your people to look up to you. And it's not that they want to make the leader look good, but hopefully the leader is inspiring them so much that they want to make the leader look good. Well, that, that, and I think that's, it's definitely critical is you got to show up. You got to be there and you got to be an inspiration and lead from the front. One of the, the principles that I, I adhere to from a leadership perspective is lead from the front. Do what you say you're going to do and don't just tell somebody what to do. You know, I had have, I have a lady in college tell me that it's just one of those things that stuck with me. And she looked at me and we were going to do something she was doing. And she said, do as I say, not as I do. So she lost all credibility at that point with us because she was doing something that we wanted to do, but we weren't supposed, she, what we weren't supposed to do. We knew the rules. And now all of a sudden she's doing it. It's like, do as I say, not as I do. And that's, that was not very inspiring and it sure didn't lend to her credibility. So that's a, those are great principles, Eric. And you said people can find those up on your blog, which is, tell us the blog again. It's called Truth Soundings, truthsoundings.com. It's the intersection of submarine leadership and biblical truth. All right. That's great. So sounding is what a submarine wants to figure out how much water it has underneath the keel, right? You have the fathometer. So that's the sounding part. And truth is the biblical based part of the leadership. That's great. So if you want to read Eric's blog, and I'm going to tell you, I've read them. He's got some great articles in there. In fact, the last, the latest one that you printed on the, uh, the game in December, the Army-Navy game, Eric wrote a nice article on his nice blog on the Army-Navy game and the meaning to him because Eric is a United States Naval Academy graduate, and um, it actually made me tear up. I had, I had, the, I had the pleasure of going to that game um, this past December to watch. And it was just amazing to watch. Of course, Eric and I are both Navy fans, so we're both pretty happy we won. This year, we, that's right. <laughs> but the reality was, is if you want to read some of the cool stuff that he's doing, talk about his leadership principles, go to truthsoundings.com. And great blog, great, great information on leadership, and it gives you a new perspective, both biblical and military. I love that. So moving along here. So. Tell us a little bit about um, maybe some people you've met along the way. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Some people that you've met that may have influenced you, um, your leadership style, your personal life. Who are some cool people that you met? You know, that's a pretty long list. I'll, I'll tell you what, who comes to mind, Rick, because you were just talking about uh, leading out front. So let me, I uh, thought of a story while you were saying that is uh, he retired as an admiral, but at the time he was Captain Dennis Jones. And I worked for him on one of my short duties. Actually, one of my blog articles has a good write-up about him. Uh, but this part of the story is not in the blog. But when his time was coming to an end as the squadron commodore, he gathered us all together, had us dress up on our whites, and he got up and he spoke to all of us. And that guy could not keep a dry eye. And the, the line I remember most from him was he said, here's why I loved working with this group. 
Because I could say, there go my people. And I'm their leader, so I better get going and get out in front of them. And he wow, inspired us cool. that much and gave us that much authority and gave us that much responsibility to let us go and do our job. And then he would realize, I better catch up. I got to get out in front of them. Well, how cool is that? That lends to your seventh point, be inspiring. And that's an inspiring story just to, to listen to and how he put himself out uh, basically put you ahead of him. And that's the concept that we, we adhere to here at the Peak Performance Group is servant leadership. Is how do we build those servant leaders? And that's what he did. He gave you the tools, pat you on the back, and, and told you to go get him, Tiger, and was there when you needed him. Oh, that's some cool stuff right there. Thanks, Eric. Okay, so tell us a little bit of what you're doing right now. Tell, you, tell the folks what you're doing now. Um, or anything you want to promote, anything else you got going on, a shout out you want to want to give? Um, you know, my core business is uh, my company, Wellspring Financial Partners. We do 401k and pension consulting for mid to large companies. Obviously a challenging time right at this moment with what's going Ooh, on. You ain't kidding. Yeah. And, and we're being very sensitive to um, meeting the needs of our clients. And uh, But – when I say sensitive, what we want to see is we want to see the individuals in 401k plans succeed, not just the plan. We don't, we want to make sure our clients are not just providing a retirement plan to the individual, but we want to see them succeed financially. Um, you know, if there's something I would offer when I'm doing individually, Rick, and, and a shout out or somebody wants to take me off on an offer, uh, I've been very much into discipling uh, lately. I uh, met a guy named okay. John Tolson, who is just off the charts on his work and his time discipling men. And, and he has a saying of people need to provide time and truth. And he spent a little time with me coaching me on discipling. So if there's anybody out there looking to be discipled as a Christian man, um, I'm ready to talk to someone else and spend some time with them. Or if you need to find out how to do a program at your church, I, I would love. Uh, is it okay if I give out my cell phone number here? Absolutely. Just call me at 817-403-3136 and let's talk about discipling. Excellent. Discipling. That's a, and that's a core principle of our wingman group as well, is who are you discipling and who are we building for the future? You know, it's fun. I know both of us have some grandchildren and um, I just had my granddaughter just last a week ago and I've got a grandson. He said, okay, well, what can we do to prepare them for the future and really prepare the future for the world and them for the world and the world for them. So they're ready to take on the world because, you know, we ultimately all have our ex expiration date and uh, I want to make sure we leave a cool legacy. So discipling is critical. So if anyone wants to take Eric up on his discipling, give us your cell phone again. 817-403-3136. Excellent. Excellent. So, okay. So there's a couple of things before we wrap up here. Um, that I always ask all my guests, and I really would like to know. So here's the thing. These are the Coach Rick's bald truth questions. So here it is. Imagine that you're having a dinner party, and you're, it's a party for six, you being one. Who do you invite? What five people do you invite, and why do you invite them? You know, Rick, I think most people are going to pick their idols or famous people. And I'm not saying this because you kind of just previewed it, all right? So I get to pick five people to have for dinner. One That's of them's right. going to be one of going to be my wife. Good choice. The other four are going to be my grandchildren. Very cool. Now, why? Because I just want to spend as much time with those those babies as possible. Amen, so, brother. Amen. I want to teach them right from wrong. And that's, you know, that's, that's what we should be doing as, as men, as women, as leaders in our communities and our families is be, spend time with that next generation. It's like, like I said, I had a granddaughter a week ago now. Um, I won't get to see her for 30 days because of this whole COVID-19 thing yeah. that's going on. But I'll tell you what, my goal is to leave this world better than when I came in. And if I can do that through our, uh, my children and my grandchildren, then I've led a good life, which leads me to our second question. Go ahead. Can I give it? So two of those for dinner, they're only getting served a bottle at this point. So 
that. That's okay. So, That's good. You know, I want to add one more thing when it brings the grandchildren. That's for all the grandparents. I do have an email account set up for all my grandbabies, and I am typing them email. They're not going to get the account or the password until they're 16 or 18, but I am currently sending them emails about life. Uh, you know what? I did the same thing for my grandson, and um, I haven't been sending him too much, but I'm going to start sending them out there pretty quick. But I set the account up for him. So, all right. So this leads us to a second one. We'll talk about legacy. Imagine your time has expired. And there's an article being written about you. What's the title? Not what's in it, but what's the title? What's the headline, above the fold headline in your article? So, so this is my hope. My hope is that the title is Well Done, Good and Faithful Servant. Amen. Good. You can make that happen. See, that's what I always tell people. Hope is, hope is not a strategy, but... What do you want it to be? And that's what we do. We do. And so final question here. Every morning, I know you get a, you jump out of bed, and I know you jump out of bed. Um, what do you do each morning to set yourself up for success for the day? Um, I already alluded to it a little earlier, uh, Rick. I, 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 I hit my Bible on my knees without fail, okay? And some days there are some hectic mornings that you know, that's a God watch after me today. And I go through a couple of verses and I try to catch up later. But I have a standing list of prayers. It's in the front cover of my prayer journal. Okay. And as part of that list is what I'm supposed to do for the day to be productive. God gave us work, right? People think that when we go to heaven or when we get to eternity that we're going to float around on clouds or everything we need provided to us. No, we will work. Work's going to be different somehow in eternity that we don't have sin and we don't have sickness and we don't have darkness, but I pray over my day and being productive. You know, Colossians 3.23 says, work heartily, not as if for men, but if for God. And, and I pray that every day that what I'm doing to be productive in this world, that I would do so as if God was walking with me and watching over my shoulders and making sure I'm honoring him and I'm honoring my boss and I'm honoring the people that I serve. So um, do I set goals for the day? Yeah. Do I try to get out and exercise? Yes, I try to do that. But, but I think my prayer life and, and working towards what that purpose is and knowing that God intervenes in our work and it was something that God gave to us is what keeps me going through everything. Excellent. Thank you for that. So, Eric, I just want to thank you for being on The Bald Truth. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. Love your leadership principles. And I know that our listeners are going to take those to heart because they're core, they're solid. And you've experienced that um, along with social distancing and quarantining, I guarantee that. But uh, it, been, it brought some great value to, uh, to all of our listeners today. And I sure just want to thank you for that. So, and um, folks, Eric Dyson, we appreciate you coming on. This has been The Bald Truth with Coach Rick of the Peak Performance Group, the company that helps people and organizations reach their potential. If you're looking for a way to grow your organization, whether it's sales or strategic direction, the Peak Performance Group coaches can help you grow with our proven business acceleration process. Remember to get or download one or two of my books, Roll Up Your Sleeves and Get to Work, or Selling for Geniuses. While most of you are spending time at your home, it's up on Amazon. Go to Kindle, download it. Um, or you can call us if you want some more information on what we do. You can call us at 817 748 7425 or visit www.mypotentialplus.com and we can connect you with the right coach for you. This is Coach Rick and I'm telling you what, this has been a great show. We appreciate Eric. Thanks for coming on, buddy. I'm Coach Rick and that's the bald truth.